Hello everybody. The topic of this video is best illustrated by this example. Please tell me folks whether black should play a1 equals queen in this position. Please stop the video and figure out for yourself. It's an old game between Paulsen and Tarash 1888 and Zygbert Tarash in this position played a1 equals queen and then Paulsen did rook g7 check. Please tell me whether you were shocked to see White's reply against a1 equals queen folks. And congratulations if you actually saw rook g7 as a potential candidate for your opponent. And tell me right now whether black should take the rook or should do something else. Yes, we should not take the rook because if you take the rook, then it becomes stalemate. This was the point of White's last move. After rook g7, Zygbert Tarash got king h8. And after rook h7 check, should we take the rook? No, because if we take it, it's a stalemate. King g8, one more check. King f8, and white resigned because there's no other meaningful check. Well, there are a couple of checks, but both ways you can take. And it's no longer stalemate because the king can capture on h6. What is the lesson from this example, folks? Going back, what is the takeaway from this example? This illustrates nicely the current video right well if a move looks winning like this you should double check everything you should be very very careful before you play that move and you should always ask yourself whether the opponent has a counter trick right because we humans we tend to see we tend to confirm our hypothesis we tend to look for evidence in the world that supports our existing beliefs right but Chess is a beautiful game. It's a science, a philosopher's game. It's a scientific game. In chess, you need to have the mindset of potentially fortify and refute your good-looking ideas. Just like here, right? Avon, everyone can see that. Avon looks winning for black. So what? What's the big deal? But before you play A1, you should be like act like a scientist and you should seek for counter evidence that could refute your good looking idea and that's the beautiful part of chess that's one of the reasons why i love this game folks so a1 equals queen is winning but you should have seen rook g7 check in this position right so this connects to current video folks i will show you some positions following a similar theme in terms of thought process and tell you how humans can go wrong in chess because of our cognitive biases in our brains because of the typical mistakes or you know heuristics or mental shortcuts that can lead us astray sometimes on a chessboard and that explains psychologically some of our mistakes on the chessboard one more position folks that actually is about the confirmation bias it's a game of my student one of my students with the black pieces he thought he is winning completely in his position and he became cocky he was like, why are you not resigning, right? So in his brain, it's confirming the idea that the game is already won and White should resign ASAP. And this behavior has caused him to play. Can you guess the blunder? Can you guess Black's blunder? Yes, he took the pawn on B3 and then he allowed, you tell me which move. He allowed B7 and no one can stop the pawn anymore and Black must resign instantly. Blunder right we will basically talk about blunders also in this video and this is a psychological explanation behind this blunder because he was acting almost in a way that hey what are, what are we playing for the game is already over and he was even saying that you know why are you know, just resigning and he was just being complacent in his position and he took the pawn and he resigned instantly so this really interests me because this again connects to our prior beliefs our psychology our stories in our head that actually leads us to go wrong in chess positions. Instead, again, you're in a winning position with black. You should slow down. You should focus even more because people tend to do the opposite in chess. In a winning position, people tend to relax and they miss resources for the opponent, right? Because again, in their brains, the game is already over. So they start, they stop looking for counter evidence, right? Just like in the first example. So these cognitive biases, folks, well, they actually were evolved over time, right? 
because the world is a very complex place. We need some sort of models. We need some sort of shortcuts, mental shortcuts and heuristics and rules of thumb to navigate our complex lives. And this manifests itself in such biases. For example, in this case, in this video, confirmation bias that actually is with us. It's very difficult, impossible to eliminate it, stop it completely, but we can actually tackle it by engaging in critical thinking skills. Or at least the very awareness of these things can help us in stopping some blunders in chess, folks. I will show you one more position here. My game versus another student. I was playing with the black pieces. I check on E3. Please tell me, folks, please stop the video and find the best move for white. How should white play in this position? Take your time. Well, my student thought, hey, yes, you check me, so I will simply go here. And if you take me, then I will take. And that resulting pawn and game is a simple draw. He's right in his analysis. But what is the problem, right? You tell me, what is the potential problem of rook f3, which was a blunder, as you can see here? Yes, he's missing my other move, king e4. And black is winning this pawn ending easily because the pawn is going to drop, then the second pawn will drop, and black wins. So what is the problem again? It's called wishful thinking, another form of confirmation bias. White only wishes and hopes that black will take on f3. And he only checks that line. But what white is missing is another move by the opponent. Again, you must be like a scientist. You must seek, really, really seek and search for the best resource for the opponent. That's how chess works. Chess is like boxing. Chess is like tennis. Your opponent has a fundamental role in this game. And you need to look constantly of the opponent's good resources to become a good player, right? Instead, white should simply draw back the king to h2. And this position is actually a draw because white is going for activity with this nice check, take on g6, and that's a simply a drawing, drawing rook hand game, basically. It's easy draw for white, right? So white was actually almost on the verge of drawing against me, a stronger player, but he engaged in wishful thinking and he lost instantly in this position, which I thought was very interesting. Again, wishful thinking is a very common root cause of your blunders in chess, folks. Finally, a couple of positions. Another position that I was playing with the black pieces against the students. In this position, I simply go queen f6. Okay? I simply go queen f6. And my weaker opponent trusted me. He trusted the opponent. Please tell me, folks. Please stop the video. And tell me what should white do in this position. Can you see a good line for white? Take your time. This position is interesting because my student just went for a draw, right? Because he thought this resulting pawn end game was a simple draw, or maybe even black was winning, so he settles for a draw, okay? But going back, the devil is in details, yeah? Queen f6. Of course, white should take the queen. It looks insane at first sight because, hey, look, black has this pawn, pass pawn running over the board. It looks like black is winning at first sight, this pawn ending. But pawn endings are so concrete and so beautiful in chess. Check this out. It's actually white who is winning this pawn ending, folks, because of white pawns are much faster. Check this out. Queen, g8 queen, followed by takes on a2. Everything is forced. White could have forced this winning pawn ending if... He didn't trust his stronger opponent if he relied on his own judgment and visualization and if he stopped hand waving because it's hand waving. Oh, black has two pawns here. I should not exchange the queens. You know, that's a very shallow analysis that is usually happening also in lower levels. Instead of concrete calculation, people are relying on the general rules of thumb. Oh, you have like outside pass pawns. Outside pass pawns are always better in the pawn ending and I'm not going to go there, right? Instead, you should never trust your stronger opponents and check for yourself. In this case, separate pawns are stronger because simply they are just much faster for a promotion square. That's just beautiful. Of course, if the king wants to stop this pawn, then the other pawn runs, basically. Right? Concrete calculation. 
instead of hand waving. And final position is another student with the black pieces. He was dejected until he comes to this moment because he lost the pawn in a5 two moves ago. And in his mind, he was losing this game because he's a pawn down with the black pieces and he was completely demoralized in this position, right? Talking about psychology. And in his mind, black is completely losing this position, right? And white goes knight b6 check. First of all, do you think that's a good move or not? Of course, black should take. And tell me, folks, what should black do in this position? Yes, black should have played c4, followed by c3. And black wins because the pawn just runs. So my, my student was demoralized. He played king c4. And after b3 check, white is winning this pawn ending. Black lost the chance to create a pawn and win the game directly. And to me, the explanation is purely psychological because we discussed with him after the game he told me all of his mental state until this moment in this position he was already dejected he was like he confirmed in his mind the confirmation bias was taking place because in his mind the story was this hey i'm in a completely losing position so this actually right stopped him from looking for resources looking for potential blunders of the opponent and so on and maybe it's also a lack of an endgame pattern, you might say, because these pawns, right, are not symmetrically distributed. So black can actually generate a pass pawn on the C file on the next move. And black wins, right? He was so close to victory, and yet he did not even look at it. Because in his mind, he was confirming, right, the prior belief that he was losing in this position. I hope the lessons are clear, folks, right? Just to basically show you again what I'm talking about, right? Just go to this slide and talk about this for a moment. You cannot fully eliminate confirmation bias, but you can tackle it by improving critical thinking skills. And chess is a beautiful game to actually improve your critical thinking skills because of its very nature that you need to have this objective mindset all the time. You need to be like a scientist almost to have this reputation mindset, falsification mindset, right? Like if, if a person tells you all swans are white, right? You should not accept it because maybe in somewhere in the world, right? There's a black swan. So you need to seek for counter evidence to potentially falsify your hypothesis. That's how science works, right? Like you can actually only refute a hypothesis, scientific hypothesis in science, instead of, you know, confirming it by more evidence. Because maybe somewhere in the world, right, there's a reputation, there's a counter evidence that's waiting for you. So that's what scientists seek in life. And also in chess, you need to seek for potential counter evidence, although it's sometimes difficult, yeah? For our, it's sort of against our human nature. But you must be aware of these processes to play better chess, folks. Again, if a move looks winning, slow down and check very carefully. Well, do not relax. Focus even more in winning positions, right? And of course, never trust the opponent. Play against the pieces. Grigorich wrote a book about this. I play against the pieces, not against the opponents, right? And also, please, we all make mistakes. You should readjust after prior mistakes. I am also prone to this. I also lost so many games because of psychological let's say, disasters, that I make a mistake and it affects me even more and I make a second mistake in a row, right? But whenever this happens, you should just readjust, you know, wash your face, drink of water, just take a deep breath, focus on an object in the environment, in a playing hole, just, you know, let your mind to be in the present moment and come back to the present moment. And because you can't also make mistakes, as in the last example of today, folks, right? As long as you keep these things in mind, you will become a better chess player. And finally, I want to show you, I want to finish with this slide. I hope you can see it. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a codex of cognitive biases. We are only talking about this small segment, right? It's about confirmation bias. Basically, we are drawn to details that confirm our existing beliefs. But look at how many cognitive biases are there in a human brain, right? It's about human evolution. It's about psychological processes. Because we need, as I said, mental shortcuts to navigate our complex life. And there's manifestations on a chessboard that you must be aware of, folks. And I want to bring you more of these connections in my future videos as a cognitive scientist. I'm very much interested in these processes, folks. Please 
write a comment if you like this video please like it so we can reach more people and please tell me your stories of similar mistakes and blunders and your observations about the psychological roots of such mistakes more to come please stay tuned folks and i will catch you very very soon bye bye